If you are a guest here at Old Brazier's Chapel this morning, we want to welcome you, and we're glad that you've, God has led you this way this morning. Uh, it is so nice to have church family, isn't it? Uh, my family has been going through some attacks. You may know about that and you may not. I'm not going to get into that this morning. But it's good and so good to have church family. And that's not just this church family. That's Christians across and around the world. That's great to have. You know, I had uh, some tests a uh, few weeks back and they found, they thought they'd found some blockage in these carotid arteries. And had some more tests, and, and man, I just said, God, this is, this is yours. I can't do anything about it. I said, it's up to you. And uh, so I had these other tests, and they said, there's no significant blockage. Don't worry about it. So Gus, and, and I hate it that Gus is not here, being my church family, he came up last Sunday, he said, how did the other test go? And I said, well, they said there was no significant blockage. And uh, not to worry about it. And he said, well, you don't really need that much blood flow to your brain anyway. <laughs> and I said, really? I thought he was fixing to give me something real medical here. And he said, you don't need as much when you don't use it very much. So <laughs> <laughs> thanks for church family. Yeah, I was hoping he'd be here this morning. You know, this sermon was already pretty much prepared when Michael, pre uh, Michael Mason preached here not the last time, but the time before that. Does anybody remember what Michael said when he first stepped behind the pulpit that morning? He said, good morning. No, he said, you've got a good church here. He says, don't let anything mess that up. You remember that, Mickey? That stuck with me, and that goes right along with my message this morning. You know, when God first gave me this message, it was a very short message. It had two words in it. It had the word mold, and it had the word compromise. But I figured if I got up here and I said mold, compromise, and I asked Chris to come do the invitation, it'd kind of go right over your head. So God began to give me some more words to put with this. You know, sometimes churches have problems and issues that arrive where the majority of the congregation have bowed before Almighty God, claim to have accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior of their life, promise to pattern their life after Jesus. It's hard to believe that we would have conflicts, isn't it? But even here at Old Brazier's Chapel, and I feel you'd have to agree with me that we have issues that arise sometimes, don't we? But being Christian men and women, we can sit down and agree to disagree and we can still work things out as God would have us to do. But some churches develop a mole problem. And I'm not speaking of the kind of mold that grows at 70% or higher humidity. I'm speaking about a mold that we kind of place on people sometimes when they start coming to our church. And if we're not very, very careful, we slide that mold on everyone as they come in the door. A mold that says you must dress like this, act this way, live in a certain area, drive a certain kind of car. You know where I'm going with this. I didn't tell you this is going to be a message that would make you feel warm and fuzzy. Matter of fact, I didn't want to preach it, but God says I didn't have a choice. And if you don't fit this mold, we don't... We don't dare throw you out of church, but maybe if you don't fit that mold that we've established, we just don't have anything or very little to do with you, very little association with these people. We wouldn't dare ask them to go eat lunch with us after church because, well, what would our cliquish friends think if we were seen having lunch with them? Has God stepped on anybody's toes yet? 
If he has it, there's plenty more to come. You see, we sometimes more often than not, we get a little cliquish in our churches. We do it in our Bible study. We do it in our small groups. We wind up associating with people pretty much of the same stature, wealth, cars driven, homes we live in, areas we live in. You see, we want to be popular people, don't we? We don't want to hang out with anyone who could possibly drag down our popularity. Let me give you a great example. Facebook. Chris and I were talking about this this morning. How many people are you trying to get to follow you on Facebook? Again, we want to be popular. We want to be the center of attention. And let me tell you something. God wants no part of you being the center of attention because He requires that you make Him the center of attention in your life. You know, when you bow on an altar or a cornfield, wherever you got saved at, you told God, hey God, you're it for me. You're my Lord. You're my Savior. And you should have made Him the center of of your attention, of your life. It's not about us, people. And I know that's an old cliche. Jetson Franklin preached on pretty much his same subject this morning. So I got, other than these 20 times I've gone over this or more, I've got Jetson Franklin's too this morning. So you're just getting it one time. So just ask this question this morning to yourself. Do I have an immediate group that I really associate with at church and outside of church? Holy Ghost back there moving this morning, sound like. <laughs> now if you're honest with God and, and honest with self, I think you'll say, yeah, I'm guilty. I've been guilty of that. Even in our small group Bible studies, if we aren't very careful, we can get a little clickish. Clicks have no place in the house of God. And furthermore, God wants no part of that. Here's what God wants. He wants a self-sacrificing love. Now get this, church, a love that does what is best for the other person. Are you there yet? Self-sacrificing. Let me give you another example. Food distribution ministry. We've done this, what, Josh, for about 17 years, I think. And I would venture to say that there's more here in this church today that have not been to a food distribution ministry than who have. Self-sacrificing love. That's what we're to be. A self-sacrificing love. Putting others above ourself. Wow. Did I hear the shuffle of feet drawing back up under the pew from your toes getting mashed? I wish I had a pew to put mine under up here. Oh yeah, like I said, I've got this about 20 times. Probably 20 plus. Self-sacrificing love. Again, God wants to be the center of attention in your life because let me tell you something, Deuteronomy 4.24, He's a jealous God. And there's about 15 other scriptures that lead to that same statement, but I, for time's sake, we're going to use Deuteronomy 4.24, For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. So we've got the word mold out of the way, so now let's look at the word compromise. You see, we haven't got to the point, we have got to the point, that we want God to agree with our words, but what we need to do is we need to agree with God's words. Amen? You see, we want to make a statement and, and we want God to say, yeah, Don Hill, that's right. 
But that's not the way it works, people. We need to agree with everything that's in God's holy, infallible Word. You see, we've come to think that God compromises with us on small sin issues. And that's what we consider small sin issues. Let's just clear the air this morning. With God, there are no small and medium sins. They are all large sins. We kind of categorize those, those sins though, don't we? We think cliques and churches are okay. Let me tell you, it's not. Everything that God put in His holy and fallible Word, God is very serious about. There is no compromise. And some of you may be thinking, well, preacher, you preach for ten minutes. Is there any scripture to back this up? I am so glad you asked. Because over in James, if you want to turn over there, we're going to be in chapter 2. We're going to have uh, verses 1 through 13. In verse 1 it says, my, there's a little subtitle in, in my Bible that says, Beware of personal favoritism. Verse 1 it says, My brethren, do not hold the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. Have you ever noticed that in the book of James that when he uses the words, my brethren, he's fixing to point out some things in our lives that we need to change. And this morning, that's no exception. Here he is denouncing all forms of prejudice, snobbery, and the lack of respect of persons, especially with regard to the poor. You know, our list of other people's preconceived shortcomings can be very harsh and unforgiving sometimes. And it does include things like being poor and uneducated, physically or mentally challenged, or ethnically different. It even takes into account the foolish mistakes that people made several years ago. Ask yourself this morning, would you like to be helped and measured by that yardstick. I heard one no. I'm a second no. I'll assure you, I could pull any one of you out of your pew up on the stage and I could say, is there anything in your life you'd just really rather this congregation not know? And I'll assure you, if you answered truthfully, the answer would be yes. We're all sinners saved by the grace of God when are we going to stop looking down our nose, pretending that we're set on some pedestal when we're sinners saved by the grace of God? Every one of us. If you've been saved, it wasn't nothing you did, church. It was the grace of God and it was the blood that dripped from the cross of Calvary. With each drop of blood that dripped from that cross, it was washing away and paying for the penalty of Don Hill's sin and your sin and the entire world's sin. Partiality literally means to receive the face and it describes the favoritism that was shown to the wealthy. wealthy. Such conduct dishonors the Lord God Almighty who does not play favorites. Oh, and that's a good thing this morning. That's a good point this morning because if it took a lot of money to get to heaven, I couldn't make it. Probably most of you sitting here, you couldn't make it. Praise God that the blood of Jesus has paid my way and your way if you've accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life. Deuteronomy 1.17 You shall not show partiality and judgment. You shall hear the small as well as the great. You shall not be afraid in any man's presence, for the judgment is God's. Now we're in verse 2. 
For there should come, for if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes, and say to him, You sit here in a good place, and say to the poor man, You stand there, or sit at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Verse 5, listen, my, my beloved brethren, has God not chose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which He promised those who love Him? But you have, verse 6, you have dishonored the poor man do not the rich oppress you and drag you into their courts? Do they not blaspheme the noble name by which you are called? If you are really, in verse 8, if you are really fulfill the royal law according to Scriptures, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. Amen? Man, y'all quiet. I was pretty quiet too the first time I read through all this. You know, I heard a preacher preach on TV one time. He said he had a few couples in his church that just thought they had to run everything. And he said if they didn't get their way, they got mad, they were constantly threatening to leave the church, and he said it just exhausted him to try and beg them to stay. And he said this went on for some time, and he said it was just draining his energy. And he said he prayed about it, and he prayed about it. And, and one Sunday morning, one of the couples came in, and something had happened, they didn't get their way, it, things didn't go the way they thought they should have went. And he said they came to him and the man said, I'm going to take my family and I'm going to take my, my money. And he said, I'm going to hunt me another church. He said, I looked at him as solemn as I could and I said, please, don't let the door hit you in the backside on the way out. True story. I told somebody not long ago, I said, I get so drained trying to keep people coming to church. It just drains the life out of you to have to beg people to come to church and to come to Sunday school and to come to Bible study. Let me tell you something. If you've been born again, if you truly got on your knees and you accepted Jesus Christ as Lord of your life, you should have a yearning to come to church. You should have a yearning to come to Sunday school. You should have a yearning to come to Bible study any time the doors of the church are open where you can be filled with the Word of God. And let me tell you something. If you don't have that yearning in your heart, I'd be on my knees in this altar and I'd say, God, why don't I have that? Did I leave part of my salvation package on the altar? What happened to it, God? You should have a yearning to go to God's house. Our children should have a drug problem. I know you've heard this before, but our children should be drugged to church every time the doors open. They should be drugged to every funeral. They should be drugged to every wedding. Anything that the church is doing, they need a drug problem and they need to be drugged to church. You all know what's wrong with America? People got out of church. You want to know why? It's gone, as Junior says, it's gone past sin. It is evil. Families wiped out down in Sonora, Mexico. A family just wiped out. It's evil. People, I'm telling you, we're only seeing just a little bit of it. 
Scripture says this is going to get worse. You better get your heart right with God and you better keep it right with God. He better become your top priority in your life because He's going to be the only thing that stands. Verse 11, it says, For he who said, Do not commit adultery, also said, Do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so do, as who will be judged by the law of liberty. For the judgment is without mercy to the one that has shown no mercy. You know, when we fail to forgive people for their past, we say we've forgiven them, but oh, we really haven't. When we do that, God doesn't forgive us. That should scare you a little bit, people. When you do not forgive others, God doesn't forgive you of your mistakes. And I'll assure you, we've all got them. We all sin every day. My goal when I get up in the morning is to have that perfect day that I live in the Lord and trust in the Lord and I do everything right. I say everything right. And some days, I almost make it out the door before I mess that up. Amen. You've been there? Amen. For judgment is without mercy to the one has shown no mercy, because mercy triumphs over judgment. Jesus, our example, who we are to pattern our life after, was called a friend of sinners. Amen. Praise God, He was my friend. Because He didn't analyze and label people. He didn't seek out the well-healed, the well-behaved, and the wealthy. He included them, but He didn't limit Himself to their company. Jesus sought after those who were marginalized and ostracized by society, and He reached out to them with the love of God. And you might ask, but what about their sinful practice might it look like we're excusing their lifestyle? One day the Pharisee brought a woman to Jesus saying, this woman was caught in adultery, in the very act of adultery in John 8, 4. And I've often wondered, why was it the man drugged there? That's another sermon, but I just often wonder that. Notice what Jesus did though. Jesus stooped down to her level. Jesus stooped down to her level and He brought her back up to His. Can you give God a big hand of praise this morning? That God can get down to our level and bring us up to His level if we'll let Him. People, let me tell you something. If you go to get somebody out of the mire and the muck, you're going to get dirty. You ever tried to push a, help somebody push their car out of the mud? You don't have a four-wheel drive, so all you got is two or three people gathered around a car that's stuck in the mud. You're going to get dirty when that happens. And if you're going to get somebody off of drugs, off of alcohol, off of pornography, whatever it is, you may get a little dirt on you. You won't be able to keep your hands clean when you get down in the mire, in the muck, to help somebody, to help a brother and a sister in Jesus Christ to get them up and, and restore them. You're going to get a little dirty. And if you're not willing to do that, let me tell you something, God has nothing for you. You've got to be willing to get down and get dirty to help somebody out. The fact is that if people could clean their own act up before coming to the Lord, we wouldn't need Him, would we? You know, 
Some of you know, most of you I would say, I was an alcoholic for 28 years. And I'm so proud that God got down on my level and He delivered me. This is my, I think, 17th year sober. I'm so glad that He come down to my level and He's raised me back up and He's using me for the furtherment of the kingdom. I heard Sandra and I rode over to the park looking at the, the leaves are beautiful this time of year and we were listening to the Christian station and this ministry, this guy was on talking about his ministry and he was an alcoholic, he and his wife both. He's got a ministry now, it's called Soberholics. Soberholics. Wow. Soberholics. So where I used to be an alcoholic, I'm a soberholic now. But he also, he gave one other detail. He said only one out of 36 people who are delivered from an addiction make it. Let me tell you something by the grace of Almighty God. I'm one of those 36. Can you give God a big hand this morning? The church was born when God's Spirit was poured out on people from every race, every culture, every tradition and background. Would you stand with me as we, we close? You know, we would do good to use that same practice you cannot have a genuine outpouring of the Holy Ghost where people are alienated and excluded. When the world sees us as a church coming together in unity under one anointing, anointing of the Holy Spirit, only then will they want what we have. Paul wrote, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone. Everyone who believes. For the Jew first, the insider, and also the Greek, the outsider. Romans 1.16 As believers, we have the formula for making broken people whole. And that formula is J-E-S-U-S. -S. Jesus is the formula for making people whole. But before you can share in that and have a credibility, we must first be united by the Holy Spirit. And if you're here this morning, and you say, well, preacher Don, I'm not even saved. From the very depths of my heart, I pray today is the day you find salvation. I pray you get on your knees and say, God, forgive me of my sins. Wash me with that precious blood that dripped from the cross of Calvary. And make me whiter than snow. Secure that home in heaven and avoid a place called hell at all costs. You know, I'm not going to stand up here and name over a whole bunch of sins and then ask you to come down to the altar because that gives the gossips. They say, oh, did they do that? But I want you to know this morning that whatever's in your life, and you know it's not supposed to be there, or if you just need to be made whole, if you'll come down and cry out to God Almighty, He'll wash you and He'll cleanse you and He'll set your feet upon the solid rock of Jesus Christ. Amen? Won't you come this morning as Chris sings? There are prayer warriors in this church. They'll get in this altar with you. I'll pray with you, Josh, Kenny, Donnie, Josh, our other Josh, Mickey, 
there's a bunch of prayer warriors in this church. They've prayed with me. Won't you come? Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. 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 Won't you come? There's no time like the present. Today is the day of salvation. This family that was shot in Sonora, Mexico, I'm sure, I don't know how it stood with them. I don't know if they were Christian. But I'm sure when they were driving along, they never expected their life to end. So if there's anything that's between you and God, you know it. You know exactly what it is. And if you'll get on your knees in this altar, God will forgive you. God will restore you. If you don't know God, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, my prayer is that you don't leave this building today until that happens. Won't you come? Jesus is Lord. And if He's not Lord of your life, you need to make Him Lord of your life today. Don't go through those doors if you're not saved today. Won't you come?